I do have to say up front, you got to be feeling pretty silly right now, my friend. Pretty silly. If we, uh, the listener at home uh, cast their mind back to the last podcast, uh, one of us said quite prominently that they thought Kamala was going to roll this one in through the gate and crush and sorry to say, Mikey, but you should have done what I did and placed a bet on Donald Trump. This is an interesting way to deal with grief, <laughs> just completely flipping the script. I mean, I don't hate it. I might use it. Yeah. It we call this working. denial. Yeah. Yeah. It's like it's beyond denial, though, isn't it? Because it's just like you're, you did. It's like gaslighting, but... <laughs> Done so it's, poorly. Yeah. It's kind of genius. In it's a way. rewriting history where yeah. the sad reality and all that optimism and energy and excitement happened to someone else. So yeah. it's not quite so bitterly, crushingly disappointing. Yeah. If it happened like to, to someone else. I'd like to see it play out in like a court with someone who's been charged with murder and the judge <laughs> yeah. goes, you were guilty of this crime. And the, the, the perpetrator goes, you, you fucking killed her, judge. <laughs> yeah. yeah. The old, um, what is it? I, uh, your glue. What's that? What's that little phrase? I, I'm a mirror. Your Don't you know, sniff glue, the glue. Whatever bounces off me sticks to you. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. That's got a nice little rhyme to it. Yeah. That's, I'm not quite getting it, but it's something like that. Anyway, the whole yeah, well, um, wasn't me defense, which I don't think holds up. <laughs> yeah, I, be, I believe they call that the shaggy, the shaggy. defense. Yeah. Oh, God. Yeah, well, that's all right. I, I did, look, I did win uh, a, a third of a thousand dollars. Is that a term? A third of a thousand dollars is not yeah, really the you, way that most people say you it. Can, if you can say a quarter of a million, I can say a third of a thousand. <laughs> Third it actually has a lot of musicality to it. <laughs> I actually don't mind it. It's just, yeah. it's rare, I think, that I can ever have spent, earned, or otherwise involved $333. Like, it doesn't come <laughs> up quite as much. <laughs> but I like having it in the back pocket. Yeah. Yeah. I'm rounding up to the nearest 33. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Good. Oh, the, um, the, so you pocketed some serious cash then. I did. I, I so initially I had put a uh, hundred and let's just say a hundred on Trump, uh-huh. but uh, yeah, and then that was paying you know, one point five, and then I kind of upped that a little bit, and then I actually did place a fifty dollar bet on Kamala because she was like Kamala. the night before. Yeah, Kamala doesn't matter anymore though, does it? <sighs> um, Too soon. And she was paying pretty, like, it was just like an outside bet when that Iowa poll came in or the Iowa pollster, what's her Mm, name? Uh, Yeah, I don't know. All of that information has now just erased out of my brain as irrelevant. Yeah, it did a factory reset. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Just started Um, from scratch again. So I could have won a bit more, but I just thought, like, even if Kamala did win, I would have basically um, made my money back. So, But anyway, (laughs) and then I I was betting on um, kind of these kind of outside weird bets where it was like Trump to win this, these, this swing Specific, state. Yeah. yeah. And they pay pretty well. Okay. Gosh. So you're covering yeah. this year's uh, Podbean subscription. Is that right? Yep. Uh, sure. Great. And the, uh, the Google drive actually, just for our backups. Well, I actually just put it into my confetti fund, which I've just got over here. <laughs> Nick. Um, just got a little oh, piggy bank. No, I can't. Michael, which I is can't. Weird. Because I had to go to the bank to withdraw it to put it in the piggy bank <laughs> yeah. for the confetti fund. But... And and I don't even live in the country, so you'd have to mail that money to me. Uh, then I'd have to redeposit it. Yeah, or and put then it send back in the ATM. As yeah. a check. But worth it to me, honestly, just yeah. to have that physical reminder. I do have to say, um, I can't, I just, it's not a confetti episode. I just can't, it, the mood isn't right. It's like one of those like office parties where everyone's sort of forced to show up and then there's this like artificial like cheer and like a banner and thing. I just can't, I can't do confetti this week, Michael. We have to, we have to give it a rest, but I well, will I can... still take the $10. <laughs> just as a, as a sadness. And just as a sadness donation. No, I, I actually, do you actually feel like intangibly sad i mean is it actually affecting you on a day-to-day i on the immediate day after 
I but was. Just, just to be clear, we are talking about the fact that Trump won the US election, guys. Yes. Um, uh, sorry, a little bit of breaking news. <laughs> yeah. Um, the So a little bit of context. Uh, my family was in town on election day. So my parents, yeah. my sister and her partner um, were all in town. Um, they were staying with us, or my sister was and her partner. Um and we were out for dinner. It was actually the last night my parents were in town. My sister and her partner were here a bit longer. So we we're going out to dinner. We had a nice, like, fancy, you know, six of us out for a, a night on the town kind of goodbye hurrah meal. Um, and that was election day. And yeah. so we had been doing things during the day, coming and going a little bit, split up before dinner to have just, you know, some uh, downtime and prep and everything. And dad and the others were just watching the election results come in. And then you weren't watching. Nah, because I don't think this is generally true. Day of election results are so unrepresentative of the final tallies, right? Um, that all you're doing by participating in that is just subjecting yourself to more angst and terror, like moment to moment than is necessary. Right. Sure. But it's to me, it's kind of like watching a, a match, you know, it's kind yeah. of like your, your team's playing the grand final. I get it. But like it, the stakes were so high that there was like, I couldn't just enjoy it for the process of like, Oh, it's a sports game. Um, so I just sort of deliberately didn't pay that close attention. Um, and indeed, at the start, things were sort of parallel to Biden's results coming in in a way where, um, like, Biden wasn't declared the winner until four days after the count had all started to come through. And I was just sort yeah. of like, ah, you know, who knows what's going to happen. But then we got out to dinner and uh, things were still trickling in. And then the the bellwether state started to fall. And dad was like, truly like end of the world nihilistic at dinner, like was he? Like properly devastated. Um and mum was like, don't talk about that. And he's like, this is this is serious. This is like the real this shit is gonna this is in this is history today. And mum's like, oh but we're out for dinner, you know. <laughs> Every day's history, Jeff. <laughs> yeah. Um technically. And as it so happened, um our server at the restaurant was Canadian. And mm. so she had an accent that sounded plausibly like she might be American. And so we started chatting a bit like, oh, are you sort of watching the news? Like, are you following it? And she's like, well, I'm Canadian, but yes, I am. Um, and so anyway, we got off the politics discussion. It wasn't looking great, but I also wasn't like completely fatalistic. And then like halfway through the meal, I just get a nudge and uh, the phone gets held up to me and it's like... Uh, I can't remember who it was. AP declares Trump the victor or something like that. And I was just like, fuck. And I really hoped that it would just be like the two of us who'd noticed and that we could just like keep having the dinner. But then uh, it came up in conversation or the server brought it up again. And she was like, so you've seen the results. And then the mood is just like, well, fuck, this is horrible. <laughs> like really good way to kill the vibes of like a nice family dinner. Right. But my, so my question is, do you feel tangibly sad? Yeah. And why? Yeah, I do. Because I the consequences are going to be grave. The uh, first administration was only limited in its horrors due to the Republican establishment that were around him saying no to his worst ideas. They're not there anymore. Um, and very specifically, I work with a Ukrainian games company. Ukraine is fucked. Like the Russia has Trump by the balls. Trump capitulates to Putin left, right and center. I'm just really terrified that the people that I work with, their country is going to be destroyed. Like I, I just think about it all the time. I like to include myself in that when you say the people that you work with yes. and being a member of Ukraine. Yeah, sometimes I'm not sure if you know that you're Ukrainian, but yes. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm aware. Every Christmas <laughs> I've become very aware of it. Um, yeah, it is pretty uh, it's pretty devastating, isn't it? Yeah. So that and then as, you know, a gay man, there's a lot of worry in the community about the implications of another term where... All these mega shitheads are feeling empowered and violent and 
talking, you know, if they can wind back Roe v. Wade, then maybe they can wind back a, a Burgerfell and gay marriage is off the ticket again. You know, anti-trans hate is really real. So it's just fucking, it's, yeah, it does linger. I do think about it all the time. I wake up in the morning and I'm like, oh, it's a normal day. And then I remember, like, this shit show that's coming. I'm like, fuck. This is going to be funny, isn't it? Welcome to Deep Forward, everybody. This is a podcast about things that matter from two people who don't. Uh, sitting through the internet with me, my friend Michael. Hello. Hello. How are you? Oh, I sort of covered that at the top. And my name's Nick. Hi. So, are we going to do a bit of a post-mort? Well, I have no real plans. I have sort of not been closely following the political news, so if we don't, I'm perfectly happy to. But I, feel I like would like I, to. I, I have questions. Yeah. I have thoughts. So, all that said, how are you feeling about the election stuff, other than being slightly richer? I don't think I have processed it on an emotional level, and I'm not sure that I... Feel emotions. I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if I did feel any sort of like doom um, the last time Trump won. And I don't think I am experiencing these types of uh, events on an emotional level really at all. I can, um, I can theorize it in my head. I can understand uh, the grievances that people have. But, you know, I feel like a bit like a... I don't know, I have autism or something because I see, be, no, shout out to autistic. I just meant that like, you know, how pe- some autistic people can't process emotions or sure. they, they, maybe they, they struggle a bit more with reading people's emotions in their face. Yeah, or relating to it. Relating to it. So, yeah. so that's kind of why I probably shouldn't have used that as an example, but yeah, that's kind of how I feel. And I think I'm so immersed in the analysis of it that, I'm I'm kind of yeah for lack of a well it's probably not a great thing to say but like I'm prob- I just see it more as uh, the the interest for me is like the gamification of it almost uh, the uh, the strat- like the strategy and the and the the political discourse uh, and I don't think I'm I'm engaged with it in a in a, in a sense that I'm observing it but yeah. I'm not I don't feel like I'm playing in the game Sure. Weirdly. I mean, it is not where we live, right? It is happening to other people elsewhere. But at the same time, America is such a bulwark of, like, democracy and of the West and everything that a weak America risks everyone, right? Like, it is the the flow-on effects of the chaos that can ensue will affect all of us, right? Well, that's the thing. And I think the... The big threat here is, and and what could probably trickle down to say you or I, uh, living as far as, away from it as we do, is is the kind of the the uh, social stability of the world, in a way, yeah. and because everything's so connected now with social media and the internet, I mean we've already seen this um, divisiveness sweep through the U.S. It certainly comes through to at least Western countries and yep. Australia and New Zealand. Yep. And it emboldens, it seems like each side left and right is emboldened and strengthened. And I think that's where we will see it on a day-to-day level. And that's the worry for me. But I, you know, the other thing is that could have happened and maybe could have happened worse if the Dems won, you know, and this is one of the one of the things that I feel like people aren't um, uh, they're skipping over in in the political analysis is that we just saw Trump and Biden meet at the White House uh, the other day yeah. for the first time. Welcome back, which is something that Trump didn't do for for Biden. No, um, and I feel like it's we, we need to take stock and and actually reflect on the fact that it is so wild that the Democrats, to their credit, to Biden's credit. Uh, have ma- have gone out of the way really to make this transition so smooth, even when Trump was trying to sow discontent, uh, disinformation, and doubt in the election process right up until the day. Yeah, and then all of a sudden, oh no no, the results are in, and of course that's we won. Yeah, like no, it was it rigged. It was go- wild. It was rigged. It was rigged. It was rigged. The Dems are going to cheat. Going to cheat. Going to cheat. 
Oops, I won. Oh, it must have been legitimate then. I mean, it's it's autocrat playbook 101, right? Absolutely. And he's kind of just setting himself up for this imaginary alley-oop where if he loses, every everyone that he's kind of been speaking to and dog-whistling to over the last few months or few years, if he loses, then slam dunk, um, we've got another riot. And we everyone knows that if Trump lost, yeah. if it was close yeah like everyone thought it would be and trump lost it would be drama yeah to say the least yeah it would have been then another it, right yeah so but that doesn't way, mean that it shouldn't have happened no no no, absolutely not but i, I think I've, I've heard a few people expressing this and i think it's a fair fair thing to express that at some point you know people who were who are democrats and donated to democrats people that i'm listening to on podcasts and stuff they there was a point at which there was a bit of relief from them because they were like, well, okay, at least, at least we're not going to have the fucking world turn the upside Civil down. War. Yeah. Now that's not, no one should think like that in a democracy. That's crazy. Yeah. But it is interesting that, that it, w- there was a sense of relief from some people uh, for that reason. Yeah. I mean, I got lots of sort of points to go from here. Mm-hmm. I think that's true. I think that being said, the Democrats had prepared for that eventuality. Like the capital certainly would have been prepared for that eventuality this time around. Like everyone would be on high alert, much in the way, possibly a slightly uh, improper comparison, but much in the way that airports and things on the eve of yeah. September 11th. The f- safest day to fly like, is the day after a terrorist attack. Yeah, yeah uh, on high alert, right? So... Uh, you know, I think that that could have been managed. I wonder what Trump's reaction would have been, because I still stand by the idea that he didn't really expect to win. I just, I don't think his vibe was that he was confident this was in the bag. Um, so I do wonder if there was a huge loss, what his reaction would be, whether he really would have the stamina to go like, we're going to fight for this, we're going to f- take it back, or, you know, whether it would be a little bit m- more muted. Um, it's different as a challenger to the incumbent rather than the incumbent losing office. You know, you don't have the same powers. Um, the other thing I have is a bit of a, uh, exhaustion and frustrated frustration at the Democrat party, right? Yes. There needs to be a lot of introspection about why the fuck this happened, but all of this, all of the th- conversation just seems to be missing the forest for the trees, right? Like all of the chat about, oh, you weren't talking the economy enough. Oh, you know, the 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 policies here weren't connecting to voters who felt like they were worse off than they were four years ago and all this kind of shit, right? Yes, do that deliberation. But... I don't think you can have these conversations about what went wrong without acknowledging the fact that America is not a fucking democracy in the electoral system that it has in terms of everything from gerrymandering of districts, voter IDs, polling places being shut down, you know, minorities being uh, suppressed in the way that they can access the right to vote all the way up through the systemic level of like the electoral college the way that it's not a first past the post or a you know most popular democratic system but an arbitrary kind of 200 year old workaround like from the ground up this is a system problem right which they have just never fixed and you can point fingers all you like about oh we should have said more to this base this base this base fucking reality is that the whole system is rigged against them and to fart around looking at like, oh, we should have done a little bit more, you know, talking to Latino men or whatever, instead of acknowledging the fact that the physical and systemic realities of the voting in that country is broken is just wasted energy as far as I'm concerned. Right. Now, okay. Well, okay, I, I agree that there are the the system is fucked, the system is flawed, but it is also a system that Democrats themselves do take advantage and win uh, from time to time, um, histor- and re- won quite a lot recently. So I do think that uh, upon losing, 
I just I think I think blaming the game is is it's like fine you can blame the game we can look at that but that's that it's not productive right now to start blaming the game you know we can work on fixing it I think there is some self reflection and introspection that the Democrats really do need to do and I think that would be with the system that America has right now they need they do need to play it and. I think crying about the rules and the game is is unproductive, and I think it'd be more productive for them to actually do some self analysis. Well, I yeah, I think I yeah, I'm not sure I agree. I think I think one of the problems with the Democrats as a party and in an institution is even when they're in power, they act like they're not right. Democrats don't take the swings and enact the policies when they're in charge that an equivalent Republican president would do right because the republicans don't care about satisfying the center don't care about placating the left right they just do the shit they want done and they do it right yeah and that's yep why everything changes right the the rules about well the the um policies what's the word i'm looking for the tradition i suppose of declaring your taxes before getting into office Everyone has ever done it, and then Trump decided he didn't, so he's not going to, right? Like, the uh, ways in which the judges are appointed to the various, like, federal courts around the land, oh, uh, well, if we just don't do it, then the next president can get to decide it. And so we'll we'll hold off on Obama's appointments for um, nine months, and then Trump can put them in and get all the Supreme Courts, you know, stocked with his judges. But when the Democrats are in the same position, oh, it's an outrage, it's a thing, you know, like, you have to declare these things. They just play by their own rules. And Democrats just never seem to have this drive at the moment to actually make the systemic changes that need to be made when they have the power to do so. So, sure. you know, you've got this three-month window now where two-month window now, where Biden's still in office and we know there is a storm on the horizon, an anti-democratic authoritarian dictatorship threat, you know, approaching in January when this crazy person gets the keys to the kingdom again. And the best thing for the country is to enact into law as many protections as you can to change mere traditions into law, to replace as many of the you know staff gaps that need filling to appoint <laughs> um, judges wherever you can whatever you need to do in this two month this is not sit back and wait time this is fucking act like the world depends on it time and the democrats just never fucking act they, mm. they have so much that needs doing right now that can manifestly make life better for immigrants in the country for, you know, the next four years, and they're not fucking doing anything. Is your argument that they are, they are too often take, trying to take the moral high ground or yes. not being assertive enough? Yes. Okay. They're, yeah. they're not taking... Uh, they, they, they always have this, like... It's almost like this big brother complex, right? Where they're always looking to like appease the Republicans, to play to the center, to get the handshake across the aisle, to pass the thing that needs to be done. And it's this like exhausting one way fucking abusive relationship where the Republicans mm. don't give a shit about the Democratic approval of anything, right? Yeah, yeah, they yeah. just fucking do it and they act like they're entitled to because they are. But every time the Democrats have that power and every time the Democrats, you know, could make these changes, they don't fucking do it. And it's so yeah. exhausting. And I think it's the same thing of like, it, this ties back to my idea of like, oh, you need to do this introspection. You need to like wonder why we didn't capture the independent voter or the uncertain person it's because they never fucking actually make these big sweeping changes the last significant piece of like democratic legislation that really manifestly resonated with people was obamacare and even then yeah. the right thinks obamacare needs to be repealed even as they love the aca because the fucking propaganda has convinced them it's two separate things you know anyway yeah that, that's it feels like they don't, they don't really stand people don't know what they stand for and that's what you know, they didn't have a reason to vote for the Democrats, where even if Republicans were spitting, as you say, propaganda and misrepresenting uh, what they do stand for, yeah. at least it was something, even if it was disingenuous is the other part. Yeah. yeah. And to be clear, they, they did these polls, right? That if you take all of the Democrat policies and you strip them of an ownership, 
you just say, do you support X or Y, you know? Do you want to, you know, protect immigrants? Do you want to pay people? Do you want to tax billionaires? Do you want, you take all of those things, you put them on a piece of paper, you slip them in front of people. They are overwhelmingly popular policies. Yeah. The actual things that Kamala was was campaigning on are incredibly popular across the spectrum. But yeah, and the quite moment, moderate. And quite really. moderate. Um, but the moment you put them, you know, on next to that tag, then the, the you know, the party affiliate thing kicks in and, and, oh, no, no, I could never vote for a Democrat, even though all the things that you support is what they're offering. Yeah. Um, I, I, I want to talk to you about a little bit about, like, the, the kind of wider um, political implications or the, the kind of social social movement politically um you know and what it says what this election said what what the results of the election says but well, I, I actually have one more point actually okay. uh, that i'll just on my last topic and it's a bit of a tangent but i just want to throw it in because it's set up here sure yep i also think this is not just an american democrats problem i think this is a left problem in australia Absolutely. and new zealand as, as well and i think albanese who has been in power for what three years now has yep the exact same problem where he's always looking to the libs to try and find something that's like a central moderate policy and it's completely failed. He's met no achievements, nothing to really speak of. It's like impossible to remember that he's actually in charge or that labor theoretically, the party of the workers and the left has been running the show um, because nothing feels like it's changed. And they're so eager to appease the right wing that it's preventing them from actually making the broad left-leaning changes that the electorate would respond to that would get them back into power. So they spend three years doing fucking nothing so they can mm. then come to the election and claim, oh, we're centrist. Oh, you know, we, you know we'll you know, only give you 20% of your hex debt off. Um, and then they're still going to fucking lose and they've achieved nothing. Yeah. I, I mean, I do think part of it, I totally agree, but this is kind of globally, it's kind of part of this wave, but I do think it is post covid uh, and that's a big part of it as well. People, the economies are trying to recover. People aren't feeling it in their trolleys or in their uh, in their wallets. Yeah. And we're seeing incumbent governments all over the world yeah. lose. Yeah. Because even if right, rightly or wrongly, yeah, people aren't seeing this. They're 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 saying, well, why why are uh, fucking eggs, you know, twelve dollars a carton now? Yeah. Um and well, it's got to be this guy. This guy didn't make it better. Even if Joe Biden, you know, he's done quite a good job. Is from that, what I understand. Like, like the economy. ultimate sad irony is that Trump is going to inherit an incredible economy. And take credit and take for credit it, baby. For it. And so he should because he's a winner. <laughs> so a uh, friend of the show, listener of the show, uh, and uh, probably my most uh, accomplished friend. He's yeah, the like CEO of- Legitimately, like, intelligent- accomplished journalist <laughs> yes see he's a ceo eddie Kavanagh, ceo of the mckell institute which is a, a think tank also you might know him from his uh ambient electronic work in oslo, oslo yeah yeah um it's really that he it comes i think number one ceo of that uh like political think tank and then number two i think is ambient music oslo yeah, yeah lead guitarist of yeah. oslo Anyway, he, he, he went to the Democrat, he got invited to the Democratic National Convention, all that. So he's very clued in. I had dinner with him the other night um, and we were talking about this stuff and he made some really good points. So um, I asked him to just kind of send, if he could, um, them in a voice memo. So um, this only goes for about three minutes. So um, I'll just send this to you, Nick. Thank you. So what you're saying is that we have some mailbag, mailbag. It's, I actually have a jingle for it. I'll just play it. Okay. Mailbag, mailbag, it's the weekly mailbag. Deep thoughts, mailbag. So there's a few few things that I think are worth um, sort of reminding ourselves of before we overanalyze each individual, um, I guess, narrative about why the Democrats lost, why Trump won. Um, when you zoom out a little bit, you know, America is still just fundamentally a deeply almost perfectly polarized country. There's sort of 47% who are always going to vote on either side of an election. And it doesn't take a great deal to, to shift in one direction or the other for the outcome to, to be, um, to be flipped, of course. But when we zoom out, actually going into this election, um, it was a pretty damn hard election for the Democrats to win. Um, people do just feel like their lives are objectively worse than they were five, six, seven years ago. Um, 
when you look at all of the data around obviously Biden's popularity um, around uh, people's view of whether the country's on the right or wrong track, um, you know, those fundamentals just point to an almost impossible uphill battle for a quasi incumbent to, to run. So there are those sort of fundamentals where if you look back, if you zoom out and you were going to analyze this election, um, you know, ahead of time, you'd probably think, okay, it's not, it's not unlikely that the challenger will win. Um, then there's some more detailed and sort of, I guess, election specific uh, explanations. Now, I was sort of lucky enough to be um, in the US a fair bit in the run up to the election, including being at the DNC for a few days. And one of the big problems that the Democrats have is that, you know, even someone like me who was literally watching, you know, every speech at the Democratic National Convention, watching the election sort of intimately the whole way through, I would struggle to articulate to you what the Democrats were planning on doing over the next four or five years. And I'd struggle to say what their theory is of the problems and the pressures and the, the sort of disenchantment that most people are feeling in the country. So when they don't really have an economic agenda or an economic story or an economic explanation for people's grievances, then what happens in that moment is that a very disciplined, a very relentless uh, right wing opposition has been able to frame them as basically the party of economic stasis, where your lives won't change at all materially if they remain in power. And that the only change that they do want to bring is on these quite, you know, worrying and scary social trends like, you know, trans rights and things that people aren't familiar with and don't, uh, don't want to see. So I think there's an element of the, you know, anti-woke thing, which, are, um, you know, there, there's, there's real people pushing for changes in that regard that is, um, that is worrying a lot of people. But I think primarily what's happened is you've seen the right wing being able to capitalize on the fact that the Democrats don't really have a cohesive story, they don't really have a cohesive economic narrative. And now they're having all of these cultural uh, change issues grafted upon them and defined them. So effectively, you've had the Republicans have been able to define their opposition in a way uh, that has been very, um, very disadvantaged, uh, disadvantageous for the Democrats. So that's the sort of fundamentals, I think. Um, what you wouldn't want to see now if you're a Democrat is them say, okay, the lesson to be learned is that we throw trans kids under the bus. I don't think that'll actually materially change things without also coupling any sort of um, tempering of their social uh, positions with a really cohesive, a really clear and a really specific um, economic narrative that's actually going to make people's lives better. So that's generally my view. Thanks, Eddie. Thank you, Eddie. Uh, as always, a very erudite uh, comment. And uh, thank you for calling up and, and giving your feedback. Do you want to start with comments or I have? Well, uh, his, Eddie's there kind of echoing, I think, what we were just saying before, largely. There's a few points that I do want to pick your brain, brain about uh, yeah. that he mentioned. Um, but do you have any thoughts? Yeah, I do. And it is predominantly... <sighs> I find it frustrating that the criticism leveled against Kamala and the Democrats is always a failure of policy to win over an audience. I think there's multiple factors here. One, as we've established, the actual policy proposals they have are popular across the board with Republicans as much as Democrats. So we know in a vacuum that it is and that what they actually have is the the polarization problem right as eddie says up top you just won't get a republican to vote for a democrat even if it's in their own best interest and you see stories of republicans who voted for for instance trump off the idea we're going to get rid of obamacare and we'll just use the aca from now on which is again a complete misunderstanding of the situation. They're the same fucking thing. The thing that you want to stay is Obamacare, but you're voting against your own interests because the party says to do so, right? So we have an, a communication issue about the Democratic Party with policies that are popular not being able to actually communicate them to a voter base that actually wants them, right? right. And that's a communication problem, yes. And, you know, the Democrats need to look at how they can break through. I think you're right that if Kamala had made it onto Rogan and actually had three hours to say, I want to do X, Y, Z, that probably would have had a significant improvement 
on you know a certain base understanding what she was about and what she wanted to do which yeah. aligned with their interests but the other thing is that there is this the polarization is not merely political anymore and it's not merely like economic ideals or ideology it is like a full encompassing reality sphere at this point right each part each political party is getting news from entirely different sources effectively communicating on entirely different insulated social media and i i would say particularly on the right is detached from the reality more than the left is for all that the left can be in a bubble there is some objective truths there that the republicans don't acknowledge and so the democrats far more than the republicans have a communication issue where they have to pierce this fucking armor shell of reality in order to communicate that is not true in the other direction so it's always going to be harder for a democrat to win over a republican who is on fucking truth social getting their fox news information you know with a skewed thing and listening to a candidate who brazenly repeatedly admittedly lies right just completely makes shit up so there is a a challenge there for sure but it's i don't think a failing of policy so much as a, a media failure and a communications failure and to put my final point in before i let you respond i'm sorry um the other frustration I have with the criticism of like Kamala didn't really have a policy platform that she was, you know, able to win people over for. I find that very infuriating when Donald Trump has nothing. <laughs> Donald Trump just, I'm going to fix it, is the only mechanical way that he says he will ever accomplish anything. There's not actually granular detail there. You can look at Project 2025, I'm sure, but he's... He's not claimed that that it was play that was his playbook, though it will be. Yeah. But you know, he gets up there and he says, "I'm going to make the world better. Russia's going to fall into line. You know, you'll be eating free. You know, all all the price will go back down. Interest rates will stop. Life will be good. Blah blah blah." And that's it. Like that's all. That, that's all there. There's no like depth or justification no behind that. It's just yeah. the, the bluster. And so I find that criticism frustrating as well because undoubtedly the, the more prepared, more reality-based policy platform was the Democrats. But again, it's communication. I do agree. So I think this is... The, I, think, I think what we need to, what we need to understand, what specifically the Democrats need to understand or try to understand, is that what, that is all true, what you just said, you know, uh, Donald Trump isn't playing even remotely the same game. Correct. And the Democrats, part of their failings, you know, strategically, are that they keep wanting to play by the rules and, you know, yeah. uh, or play fair and, yeah. you know, it's just not working. Yeah. Why then, without the substance, is Donald Trump, is the, are the American people uh, decidedly voting for this man? It is not because of his policies. Of, because he doesn't have really uh, any depth or, 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 or of solid foot footing there. That it's that's not the game. The game is what what do you represent, and what does it look like? And it's that's very surface level. It is. Yeah. But that's the that's the game. It's populist, I, right? It's it's the personality. You like the person, and I think you know not to go too off into the weeds just yet. But I think republic the Republican Party is going to have a real challenge in 2028 because assuming Donald Trump doesn't try and run again, you know, break all the, yeah. the, the rules, assuming that he's out, right? I don't know who you fucking put forward that is going to have that same ability. But I'll let, I'll let yeah. you get back to your point. Yeah, I mean, that's a, but it's a good point. Like, does, Ma does MAGA continue as the ethos of the Republican Party post-Trump? I think it is, it's a, it's, it's aesthetic, it's, it's hollow, but I mean, Trump is a is a contradiction with legs. He is a billionaire that is supposedly representing the working class better than you know a prosecutor. He's a, you know a criminal uh, that is running up against a you know a prosecutor. Like it's he's he has so many contradictions uh, that it's just hard to hard to understand. What any of, oh the other a contradiction that I was uh, remembered earlier was that he's he's a, a liar. But he's also weirdly authentic, and you might push back on that. But there is an authenticity to his. Oh, he one hundred percent. 
says what he thinks. Exactly. So these contract like it makes it baffling on paper that a guy like this can get can get elected by not just uh, you know, gun toting hillbillies, but Latinos, Puerto Ricans, black men, you know, black women, and astonishingly, Gen Z, and not yeah. just Gen Z women, Gen Z men, uh, not just Gen Z men, Gen Z women. Yeah. So what is he representing? And I do think that the Democrats do. It would be worth their while to self reflect on where they have come. And I don't think he was saying this before. I don't think he was saying that the left has nothing. You know, to to that they. There's definitely some loonies on the left. I think you were kind of maybe admitting that. Yeah, of course. But 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 I think socio socially and uh, you know broadly politically, the left does. And part of this is again part of this is right wing propaganda. Um, you know, say this this anti woke stuff that is right wing propaganda to a degree. But there is a degree to which there is something there. I think and people. People can see it. People can, you know. I think uh, wokeness, and I know people, and people, people who are woke hate that term now, but I think we all know what it means. I think wokeness is seen as a luxurious position to take or uh, ideal to have because, you know, people. I think most people would agree that uh, in America, I mean, or maybe worldwide, that okay, yeah, every trans people should have all the rights that 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 we should have, and there should be, uh, you know. Um, measures in place to stop hate speech and stuff like that. I think that's reasonable. But I think when people can't put food on the table and they're seeing pronouns in uh, Kamala's bio, for example, I think that for better or worse, they're thinking, okay, well, you're not, you're not representing me. You're on another planet. And I think I'm not, I'm not saying that this is what I think. I'm just saying that's, I think that's the perception. And I think it's worth the Dems reflecting on that. And I've just, I was just watching Van Jones, um, who's a CNN political an- analyst. Uh, he's a black Democrat. He was on Bill Maher. And he said something really interesting, and I wrote it down, if you don't mind, Nick. Okay. I came really prepared for this episode. I love I? it. I came completely unprepared. This, he said, Van Jones says, despite all the shitty res- irresponsible things, um, this, I'm paraphrasing and then I've got a quote. Despite all the shitty, irresponsible things Elon says and does, it's sad that the Dems have pushed him away and lost him. He was an Andrew Yang Democrat four years ago, and it's the same with Rogan. Uh, you know, this is the first time Rogan's ever voted for a Republican, and he was famously a, a vocal Bernie and Andrew Yang supporter not too long ago. This is, uh, this is the quote. If progressives have a politics that says all white people are racist, all men are toxic, and all billionaires are evil, it's kind of hard to keep them on your side. So we might want to think about if you're choosing, if you're chasing people out of the party, you can't be mad when they, when they leave. So we should all have a politics that says all people deserve dignity and decency, and maybe more people would stay. But I think that is the policy. And I think the idea that the democratic argument or the left argument is uh, all white people are racist is a straw man. I don't think that people will genuinely claim that or if they do a vanishingly small minority right yeah but it's i, I think i, I, I eddie because um, eddie, i read that out to eddie it was a really fun dinner actually i read out that quote to eddie and um he said the same thing he said you know the obvious answer to that is that kamala and, and kamala. biden kamala sorry uh didn't run on these platform uh, on these poli- on this stance right and i agree they didn't but but they they represent the left to some degree, and that is the perception. And I think even yeah. if it's just social media and clickbait, yeah, um, it, it's that is a perception that people do have, rightly or wrongly, that they they do. There's like this original sin. If you're a straight white man, uh, you're kind of being born into this. You know, you've got something to apologize for, kind of philosophy. But I, I think uh, yeah. that's real. I, I think that you're right. That the sentiment is true. I think that is what people think. But I. I think the problem is not the democratic position. I think it's it's the communication, right? It's the it's the institution, right. the media bubble, and the effectiveness of the right wing propaganda, right? Um, you don't see quote left wing propaganda winning over people, really, right? right? No. What would that even look like? What does it look like? You know, it's it's a bu- it's a bugbear of the right that they're pushing this shit down your throats, but really, it isn't. Yeah. Um, but the right wing side of it is just this impermeable unreality state now 
where even if you disagree on social issues or whatever, um, that that there's there's no possible way to agree on <laughs> like standard reality, like what happens at you know a political convention, like what the party policies are, what they stand for, right? It, it's yeah. just there's no actual common ground there anymore, which does bring me back. And I guess the other thing here, when I when I keep sort of deflecting from the democratic introspection, it's not because I don't think uh, that there are things that they needed to do better or that they need to be aware of or to self-examine. And as I've said, I, you know, I think arguably they need to enact policies that are more ambitious rather than centrist in order to be able to point to manageable improvements that can win over a voter. Um, but I think you have to go back and you have to say, well, look, at the numbers of people that turned out, right? So you have millions of people fewer came out than in 2020, right? So yeah. off the back of uh, four years of Trump, Democrats showed up in droves, right? Huge turnout. And yet with an incumbent where they'd had four years to sort of be placated into sort of life as normal, we don't have to wake up every morning and worry about your existence again, they didn't show up. I think there's a valid arguments to be made that the Biden administration's handling of the Israel-Gaza situation uh, alienated a whole slew of what would otherwise be um, Democratic voters. Um, you're going to find people who struggle to come and vote for the person who, in their eyes, you know, enabled a genocide and set yep. it out, right? Yep. So lots of things to criticize on. I agree. And I think there's also this, I was just thinking about this, like, you know, in the immediate aftermath of the election, a lot of people go, well, this is a reckoning for the Democratic Party. This this, this shows where America's at. Yeah. And I was thinking, well, I was looking at the votes and I was like, we're talking about a couple million people here in, what, 350 million? Yeah. I mean, what if... A lot of uh, part of me thinks is like, is it just chance? Because m some people might have just woken up and they were going to vote for Democrats, and they're like, "Well, I have to take the kids to school, and yeah. this has come up." And like, we're talking about a margin of difference here, yeah. And then we act like it's a shift in the way American yeah. thinks. It's like it's probably not. Yeah, I maybe, mean, maybe it it's shifting how it feels, but not how necessarily reflecting how America thinks on the whole. You can always rely on the Republicans turning out to vote, right? And Democrats, you can't. Democrats, like I said, huge turnout in 2020, far less this time. And maybe that's revealing some, again, of the intrinsic sexism or racism in the American people. Like, oh, I'm not going to vote for a woman, much like I didn't vote for Hillary. I'm not going to vote for a, you know, a black person or, you know, Indian descent. You know, who knows? But th that is the deciding factor, right? It's like literally people through the door. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I, I think America's had two women run, and they, you know, they, I don't know. I don't know how likable they they were to the American public. You know, I, I just don't. I don't. I don't buy into the. Uh, well, that's you know, people didn't vote for Kamala because Kamala. I'm getting there because she's black or she's a woman. I don't. I don't there's, there's no sample size really to be statistically significant. Yeah, I mean, but it's it's becoming more of a trend now. It's happened twice. <laughs> okay. I mean, yeah. Uh, anyway. Anyway, you, you can't, no one's going to, you know, in a vote, you know, if you try and poll people and say, did you not like Kamala because she's a woman? No one's going to say, oh, yeah, that was the main reason. I wanted a man as president. You know, th that's not the kind of information people reveal about themselves. But um, sure. But I mean, I mean, Trump's, what, Trump's, most people say that they dislike Trump. Yeah. So maybe that does speak to your point because... You know, most people will say that they, you know, wouldn't want want him to, you know, be alone with their wives, or, um, you know, they they don't respect him as a as a person. They think he's a bit think he's a bit dweeby or whatever. Um, but they still voted for him. Maybe that is because they, you know, even even if they don't like Trump, uh, a, a man a dislikable man is better than a dislikable woman. Well, I think, I, I, no, I think they're just more fixated on the goals, right? Like they'll hold their nose, much like they did it the first time. They'll hold their nose and vote for the party, right? Because the long-term goal of we'll have the Supreme Court locked down and the, you know, the policy platforms enacted that I want outweigh the fact that, oh, he's a bit gross, right? Every, every fucking Republican candidate hated him until he was president and then they had to like him, right? That same thing doesn't can't be said for the Democrats. Democrats aren't very good at holding their nose and voting for the person for the good of the country or for the platform, right? They right. really want 
to believe in the person because they're aspirational. Yeah. They're more highfalutin and they're, they're, they're dreaming big. And I don't know. I think that means they don't turn out all the time. I mean, maybe, I mean, I just, I can't help but think um, that Bernie, if the, if the, if the, if the Dems just got their shit together and fucking put Bernie forward in 2016, it could have been a whole different thing because Bernie yeah. does represent some actual change. Hillary, as much as, you know, I do think that she, you know, at least shattered the glass ceiling. Um, it, Bernie represent, she was part of the system and Bernie represented radical change. I agree. And that's what they need. I think, I think you're right that if 2016 had come along and Bernie had been in the ticket, some portion of that centrist, economically affected, disaffected white man vote that slid right, that slid into the MAGA camp, I think could have been won over by a a truly, you know, independent left leaning Bernie Sanders ticket. You might be right, yeah. Yeah. Anyway. So saved saved the world again, Nick, didn't we? Have we? I think we've just vented our emotions a little bit. But oh, okay. it had to be yeah, it had to be done. It was fun. It was fun. So I guess we'll just wait and see. Maybe January six. It's the left's turn to start storm the capital. Yeah, that'll be fun. Wouldn't but they do more like a pussy hats. <laughs> do it more as a sit-in. Yeah, yeah. Everyone's everyone's smoking weed, and it's yeah. more like a Bonnaroo. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we're just like listening to the the new Beatles record, the Dems erection. Yeah, yeah. it's uh, yeah, it's uh, a lot of love, a lot of yeah. free love, a lot of free hugs. Yeah, we'll kill them with kindness. Yeah. Uh, okay. Well, I feel better. I feel bad, but I still feel better. It was nice to talk it out. You're not you're not really having a beer with me these these days on the pod on the Sunday. I thought it was so it was kind of our tradition. It's true. It's been a long time. I don't actually have beers in the house at the moment. I, I've sort of okay. stopped drinking a little bit, really. Oh. Doesn't, well, it doesn't help I'm with the physique. Using... Uh, yeah. Well, speaking of that, I've uh, I went to sorry, see a physiotherapist. Hey. For the first time. Oh, didn't how, even know how, what they why? did. Um, well, the why I can uh, I can't tell you on the mic. Oh, uh, but it's so you can off. practice getting on down on your knees to propose. I got a neck. I got a neck injury. Oh, say that. <laughs> but bleep this. Uh huh. Oh, yep. So that was really fun to explain to the uh, yeah. therapist. Anyway, um, so I got this neck in- injury about a month ago, and then the pain just kind of started spreading over the next few weeks down my shoulder mm-hmm. and down to my back. Mm-hmm. And it was getting to the point where it wasn't like debilitating, like every day I couldn't, I couldn't move my shoulder, but every now and then I'd accidentally sleep on that side and I'd wake up and I'd yeah. be like unbearable. Yeah. And then there'd be certain movements. And this is the crazy thing that I couldn't, couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't work out exactly. You know, if you cut your leg, yeah. you know that you can limp on your leg and that's where the pain is yeah. and that you have to kind of compensate for that. This yeah. one, it would just be random movements. Yeah. And so it was really kind of frustrating. So after, after a month of this bullshit, I was like, you oh, lasted a whole there. month. Well, I did go to the GP actually, oh, yeah. and he just put my arm in a sling for a day. And oh, well, fucking useless. I didn't. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so I went to the physiotherapist finally, and he diagnosed me with thor- thoracic outlet syndrome. No shit. Yeah, dude. Do you can, let you me that- say, one of my friends here has thoracic outlet syndrome. I'm not shitting. Oh, really? You. Yeah, she's had a fucking brutal time of it. I have to say. Wow. Well, I might be on the. How old is she? Same age, thirty five. Oh, fuck. Well, I had no idea what this is. A yeah. syndrome is, I like to say it, for dr- dramatic effect, it's but it's not. It's super impressive. Thank you. Well, speaking of that, so I had to do all these moves. I, d- I genuinely didn't know what a physiotherapist was. Yeah. I, I didn't know what they did. I thought they'd give you a bit of, uh, they'll be like a fancy mess bit of a poke masseuse. And yeah. yeah. So, um, he was getting me to do with these moves. By the way, the longest the longest time that I've spent in a room shirtless with another man oh. in a quite a, a small room. Yet. I didn't hate it. I'll say that. <laughs> um, and he's getting me to do these movements and he's filming my back and stuff. And so he's, he, sh- he shows me on the thing where on his, on his camera 
that um yeah he filmed me as well um <laughs> he, he showed me his, it was like my shoulder my shoulder blades on my right side is like significantly lower than my left and it was like stark yeah i was like holy shit anyway he said that he said it he asked me if i'd done any like throwing sports growing up he was like you've got the shoulder blades of someone who's like been doing discus or shot put oh like i took it as a compliment yeah but, I don't but think it sounds meant. like a criticism yeah <laughs> Yeah, it's like wear and tear you from it up. that. Yeah. Um, and what he reckons happened is when I got this incident on my neck, um, it kind of uh, hit a nerve, and then f- because the mu- the muscles were already kind of in a weird space yeah. at my neck, because all the tendons run straight down from your neck to your back to your shoulder. Yeah. Uh, not in that order. Um, you can look it up. <laughs> Uh, they cut the the muscles. The muscles are kind of spasmed and then kind of flipped the ta- the tendons or something, whatever. Yeah. Anyway, so now it's, that's what's causing that. So, um, gave me a nice deep tissue massage. That was nice as well. It was quite yeah. romantic. They're actually um, like a physio massage is really fucking good. The, it was um, really good. And the, it had the, really strong hands, and I shouldn't have said that to him because that made it weird. But. <laughs> was, uh, Oh, this is the first time I've been jerked, uh, rubbed up, rubbed up, uh, <laughs> someone had a, uh, his hands on me. I genuinely thought of, because he, he was kind of a funny guy. Yeah. Uh, hey, I genuinely thought of making a joke like, do you, yeah. kind of, how much for a happy ending? But yeah, I, I yeah. didn't do that. That's but very I did good ask, self-control. Well, you know, it, it's kind of that awkward guy thing where you kind of, you, you realize that it's an intimate thing, that what's happening yeah. here is, is another man my age rubbing me down. Yeah. And, and nibbling I'm, on your ears, yeah. And, and my nipple, yeah. <laughs> which I thought was weird. <laughs> but so you, you kind of want to like talk about something else, sports or whatever. It's but so funny how often I, the physio talks about sports with me. It's so funny. I can't, I can't talk about sports. No. So I, I instead, my version of this was to say, hey, level with me. What's a chiropractor? Is that a real doctor? Yeah. Give me the goss. Yeah. And he was like, well, first of all, I wouldn't say, you know, wouldn't shit on any other profit. But then he just totally shat on chiropractors. Yeah. And I loved it. It was great. But anyway, I have to just do these uh, uh, fucking whatever they're called. Uh, stretches. Exercises. Yeah. Yeah. That's, um yeah, I, I'm still reeling sort of from the fact that you have the same thing my friend does at the moment because she's really fucking been through the works with it, like properly bad. But also this is very familiar for me because I, I get migraines all the time and my whole like neck traps, shoulder, right. like posterior chain stuff is so tight, like crazy tight. To he the kept point- asking me if I got migraines and, yeah. and headaches. Yeah. He, like, kept, he actually kept hammering that. Yeah. Um, like crazy, uh, uh, sort of intense. Um, and to the point where I've had in the past, you know, year or two, I've had issues where I would do maybe like a gym exercise and maybe the form is just ever so slightly wrong for one rep or something and it yeah. yanks. And then yes. I have this pain in my back because it's on such a like taut muscle yeah. fiber it's a already. Slack the, line. the slightest yeah. little bit of like yeah um it's a guitar string <laughs> exactly in precision and it just fucking goes to the point where exactly that same thing sleeping can be incredibly painful and mm. turning over in the middle of the night you know one side is just an agony you know i'm totally with you and i'm glad that you saw a physio about it because i i it's the only sort of treatment i think i found that has had reliable results yeah, I mean, like I said, I genuinely didn't even really have a good idea of what they did. And yeah. I've got private health and, yeah. you know, it's getting towards December now. I'm like, fuck, I need to do Spend something anyway. with my private health, so I might yeah. as well do this. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, it was, it was quite an interesting experience. And he was so good at, you know, explaining all the tendons yeah, and, the and how the muscles intersect. It was really interesting. I was really, like, genuinely interested in what he was saying, like, just from a scientific point of view. Yeah. I mean, but, but to bring it sort of full circle here, the... So I started going to the physio because I was getting pain running, right? I had sore knees and I'd been to a doctor. In the end, I went to four physios, two running specialists, a chiropractor, a general physician, um, a podiatrist. I had two x-rays. I had an MRI, like went through this whole series of things to try and sort out why my knees had started hurting when I was running. Yeah. Didn't solve it. Didn't get a clear answer. The MRIs got the closest. They showed uh, almost a meniscal tear. Technically, a meniscal tear has to be from top to bottom, you know, complete separation. Mine was halfway torn. So it was, it was enough to call it an abnormality, but it wasn't enough to call it a tear. 
Yeah. Anyway, point being that in that process, I'd been seeing this guy sort of fairly consistently, this physio, and we were, you know, giving at-home exercises to do and, you know, strengthening stuff, which is quite fun, actually. Um, but then it got to this point where, like, we'd exhausted the options. And he said, mm. look, realistically, your best bet is probably to start going to the gym and start lifting some weights because you can't do any more sort of body weight stuff to help oh, no strengthen wow. the legs. And yeah. that is the reason that I started going to the gym to try and fix oh, wow. my running. Never fix my yeah. running. Realized yeah. I like the gym anyway and just quit running. <laughs> yeah. And now you get heaps of dick thrown at you. Now I get dick everywhere I go. When, when you did an MRI, were you ever, did you, were you ever worried about getting sucked into space? <laughs> I don't have anything metallic on me. All right. Yeah. They freak me out, those things. It's very loud. I'll give him that. It's an extremely okay. loud piece of equipment. Interesting. Elon will fix it. Oh, fuck Elon. Fuck Elon, fuck Donald Trump, and fuck Joe Rogan. Uh, <laughs> if you've enjoyed this podcast, uh, thank you and apologies. Uh, we have plenty more episodes back in the back catalogue, and I expect that you will enjoy all of them at least to a 7 out of 10, and probably higher. Um, you can also get in contact with us if you have things to say, like Eddie did. You can reach out to us on Instagram. You can send us a message on Facebook. You can send an email to deepfort at gmail.com. You can uh, listen to our songs and our episodes on Spotify and on Apple Podcasts, where you can rate them both five stars. And if you want to improve the world, you need to actively advocate for America to change its electoral system, because without it, things are fucked. I'm going to let the dog out. She wants to get out. How is old Goose Springsteen? She's going? very good. Oh, good, good joke. Good pun. I like uh, that. Goose Springsteen. Thought of that this morning, actually. Goose Willis. Uh, it's funny how quickly you get the uh, the little nicknames that turn up. She's become a bit yeah. of a goo goo doll recently. Oh, okay. Um, Lucy Goosey. Lucy uh, Goosey's okay. Yeah. I think Goose Willis is pretty good. Goose Willis is not bad, but it, I'd want a girl name is the thing. Um, she's right. doing well. Not, she's not, a, lot on, of, not a lot Goose of Jenner. girl Bruce. <laughs> Goose Jenner. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Oh, oh, boy. That was good. Leave it in. I'll leave it in for you. Um, she's put on two kilos in the time we've had her. Um, oh, that's so okay. she's growing big. Don't fat shame. No, no, I'm not. She's just getting, like, she's a real size dog now. How's Peppers? Oh, she's yeah, she's all right. She's a bit um, Pepsi Jenner. Pepsi Jenner, huh? Oh yeah, because of the ad. Yeah, not quite as good. Uh, um, yeah, she. We had to. We went camping last week, and she just like the two nights before. <clears throat> um, she started like getting diarrhea and <laughs> shitting in the in the house in the middle of the night, oh. uh, which is something she never does. And we were when we we're going camping, dropping her off to my sister's house who they live in an apartment, her and yeah. Chris. Um, and it was like this weird thing. I was like, ah, the day before she started She's to get a bit better. And I was like, Fuck, I don't want yeah. to do that to my sister. Yeah. But we did it anyway. And she did shit in the house. And <laughs> yeah. Uh, I don't want to do this, but we did it anyway. Yeah. Well, we, I don't know. It was a gamble, but they were good about it. Um, hey, I got a few, I got a few wrecks that have sort of been sitting in my pocket for a while. And I want to talk light. I want to talk fun. I've just been watching TV I just, I needed an escape. Let Can we please do a wreck? That sounds lovely, Nick. Perfect. They'll never know that was the second take. Welcome to Deep Thought's Recommendation Engine. Uh... Hey, we're back. I'll just take that again. Hey... Oh, we are back. Are you ready? Are you pumped? Are you trumped? Fuck. I circled back to it again. Um, can I start, please, Michael, with a movie? Please. You'll find it on the website netflix.com. It stars a man called Will Ferrell. It is a film <gasps> called Will and this Harper. This is on mine. Yes. This is mine. Harper and Will. Is it? I've yes. got it wrong. This Huffer is on mine. It's my first one. Cute. Oh, how We're cute. So cute. We're so cute. We are cute. Uh, this also, is a that really frees me out for another one. Oh, okay, good. <laughs> this is a really cute documentary that Will Ferrell made. Um, 
I'm not actually sure where the initiation came from, whether Harper was decided to do it or Will decided to do it. I don't know how it came together, but uh, so Harper's longtime friend, uh, sorry, Will's longtime friend, who was a writer on SNL, um, came out to him and announced that she was trans, was going to go by the name Harper. And that was the first time that Will Ferrell had ever experienced what, you know, the realities of that was like for someone. And as a straight ally, he decided, let's go on a fucking road trip and let's just talk about it and live it and ask all the awkward questions. And the documentary crew comes along and it's just a really charming, really touching, really emotional, beautiful piece of work. It really is super charming. Um, Very funny also as well. And, you know, I think, I think it could, uh, you know, well, probably not the type of thing I'd be like, I'd probably expect it to be kind of a bit, I don't know, preachy for lack of a better word. Yeah. But there was a, there was a joke in the trailer that made me really love. And I think you probably know which one it is where uh, Will says to Harper, can I ask you a question? Do you think now that you're a a woman, you're a worse driver? And (laughs) that was, that was so funny. And just like, okay, this is going to be nice. And, it was, as you say, charming, and I, I, I cried. I cried. It's yeah, I totally cried as well. There is, yeah. oh, for the first half, I think you're right. Like your hackles are up. It, you, you're a little bit like, where is this authentic? Is this performative from Will's perspective? Is this manipulative? Like where's, yes. w- where's the truth lie here but he explores that himself he asks himself those questions exactly and also reckons with the fact that his fame brings a certain safety blanket to harper by proximity where maybe if she was in those places alone she's not certain that she'd be accepted so easily but that's the point at which the film then steps up a level and you get to Two really remarkable things. You get, I mean, it's full of lovely scenes and, and moments and things. I actually wanted it to be longer um, as a film. Yeah, me too. But um, yeah. you get moments where she decides to go into a bar herself in, you know, bumfuck nowhere and see how well she's received. Uh, you get moments at a NASCAR rally that are incredibly touching, yeah. which is when, you know, you start to fill those tears yourself. Um, yeah. And then the real rug pull for me is this astonishing sort of late, you know, third act moment where you find this house that she'd bought. Yeah. And that's when you it gets incredibly real, both mm. as a film and as I think for Will as well, when he realizes the depths of, you know, the pain that she was in. Um, and at that point, I was like, this is a fucking masterpiece. Like, this is an incredible film to have hit that moment. Yeah, and there was that great moment where uh, she's at the family home and she's uh, part of the thing was part of the story is that she used to unicycle and there's a kid yeah. on the unicycle at the front yeah. just happened to be there and yeah. she asked him to, to have a go and yeah. you know, it was pretty cool. Yeah. And then the kid's like, the, you will, Feral. Yeah. <laughs> the sister is really cool. Like the kids are really cool. Like yeah. interesting to see the different angles of it covered. Um, an incredibly awkward meal and like a, texas restaurant yeah and then the aftermath of that is really explored Um, yeah yeah i just really i was really uh moved by it i thought it's Uh, really compelling yeah i think why it really works is because they are will and harper are comedians and they so they come at it from a i think humor is really uh a great way of communicating these sorts of complex emotional issues sometimes because it, 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 by by their nature, they're they they're kind of just jostling around with each other. But humor is also uh, there's an equality to humor. Yeah. If I can if I can make fun of you and you can make fun of me, we're, we're the same. Yeah. There's no hierarchy there, and I think that's why it really works. Uh, and I think not and to get Harper too, is really game for it. Absolutely, but I think that's I think that's where. Uh, a lot of the misunderstandings or the even racism, bigotry, whatever, comes from, uh, you know, oh, I, I can't touch you, you're up, you're up here. And, you know, it's almost like a, you don't have any faith in the person that they can't hold their own. You can't make a fun of this person because they're X, so Y, or Z. Yeah. Uh, but if they can't, it's like, okay, cool, we're all, we're all pieces of shit, you know. <laughs> uh, but I think, that's, I think that's a great message. I love that, mes- that movie too. Yeah. 
I got a quick movie for you too. Please. I think I watched this back to back with Harper and Will. Um, it's called Flipside. It's a documentary about a records a guy who well, it's about it's kind of centered around the, around this uh, this record store, uh, but it's mostly about the the filmmaker himself. You, uh, he's got a recognizable face, but I don't know. No, I don't know him by name. I don't think I think you'd recognize him, but not know him. Um, his name actually is uh, Chris it. Wiltshire, Christopher okay. Wiltshire. I think he's done some work with Judd Apatow, Jake Gary Shandling, and stuff. Anyway, uh, it kind of this. I won't. I don't want to say too much about it because I do think people should really watch this if you really want a great doco. But it's a man kind of wrestling with, you know, he want he had aspirations to be, you know, a big film director, and then kind of found his way doing, you know. Uh, having a successful career but doing commercials for kind of corporations and it's a guy who's trying to reconnect with his more idealistic romantic younger self i do know his uh, ass. i couldn't yeah. tell you where but yeah and that that message to me is is like something that r- just really hits me right on the the funny bone um and it's another tearjerker for me but it's kind of an, a feel a very philosophical film it's got some very eccentric characters in it it's very fun, but it's also very uh, deep in a way. And uh, uh, yeah, it's called Flipside. You should you should really check it out. Excellent. I uh, will. Is that on Netflix as well? No, don't think so. I'll have to. Look I don't for know it. where here. Yeah. yeah. All right, great. So the next one on my list, Ali Wong's latest special. Have you watched Ali Wong's special? No. So I, what what do you have a general vibe about Ali Wong? I got a vibe. I don't know if I've seen a special from start to finish, but yeah. I like what I've seen. Yeah. She's pretty funny. She's pretty self-effacing. Um, actually, she's not that self-effacing. She's quite confident in a way that's funny from like almost braggadocio. So maybe that's the opposite. Yeah. But um, very um, assertive, but also very publicly uh, pregnant on her first special. I think pregnant, pregnant again. No, like legitimately, like that was, she was no, I know, enormous, but you know. I think that's a good name for a special, publicly pregnant. <laughs> yeah. Um, and you know, the first two specials were all about this like long-term relationship with her husband and then they broke up and she's now dating Bill Hader. Um, so is she? Yeah. So this is a, a special, the first special since the divorce, um, since her kids are now old enough to watch her shows. Um, it's just a really tight, fun hour. Um, we enjoyed it. I, I don't have much more to say because it's like a comedy show. Like just watch it. And if you like her voice, you like it. But, um, yeah. It was just, it was a fun hour. I enjoyed. Yeah, she's, um, she came up with a lot of these New York com- comedians that I'm, I listen to their podcast. So they speak about her very fondly, even though I haven't really gone out and yeah. watched. I've also got a comedy sh- special for my last rec, Nick. Love it. Um, I watched it last night and it was, whoo, it was a knee slapper. Uh, <laughs> a- Adrian Yapalucci is her name. Adrian Yapalucci. Not a big, Comedian. Now, caveat, she is pretty dark, uh, pretty offensive, and I feel like you're going to see one word there, Nick, that is going to turn you off when you Google her. Adrian Yapalucci, the dark queen. I see. That's right. I'm not saying now, one was word. It direct, was it directed by Louis C.K.? Yes, it was. Did she oh. open for Louis C.K. when he came to Australia? Yes, she did, but my God. She's Australian. No, she okay, just, she just came with her. She is so fucking funny. Uh, so don't hold the Louis thing against her. I would say, I haven't met your friends in New Zealand, Nick, but I would say to all of our New Zealand listeners, probably give this one a miss. Uh, a <laughs> bit dark. Not to put preconceptions. I mean, yeah. Um, she ain't no Ali Wong is what okay. I'm saying. Um, <laughs> there's some edgy stuff there, but I was dying with laughter. And that's been the first time I've been like proper on the floor laughing at a comedy special for a long time. Okay, well, maybe I'll watch the trailer and get a sense. Um, I don't hold uh, Louis collaborators against him, her. Yeah, she is, she is a woman. She is um, a woman, Nick. you got to give her that. Pamela Adlon's Jeez. series Better Things was incredible. Created by Louis. Love the picture out halfway through. But um, anyway, I will, I will keep an eye out. I have, I have a couple of... That's on Netflix, by the way. Thank you. I have a couple more last minute recs here. One that I think you would genuinely like and one that I'm saying for everyone else's benefit. Right. Can you say that one first and then can I just sign off? (laughs) Yeah. Uh, English teacher. Have you heard about English teacher? 
Uh, it is a show with the guy that I like, Chris Brian, O'Dowd. No, Brian Jordan Alvarez is his name, I think. Uh, I might have got those names the other way around. So this is the one that uh, English like, teacher. Right? Yeah. So it's created by and stars Brian Jordan Alvarez. Um, it is a FX comedy. FX comedies, I think, if you pay enough attention to TV, you know the sort of vibe that that's after. It's directed yeah. by Jonathan Kreisel, who did Baskets. So it's got a really beautiful directorial flourish to it. Um, and I think it's one of the few recent American comedies that has that high jokes per minute that perhaps not like at a 30 rock level, but it's not better things sort of sitting in a dramedy kind of mode. It's like a comedy with lots of good, funny moments. And it's just in a school with this gay English teacher character just going oh, about his life is. and here propagating the work <laughs> agenda okay, into the yeah. students. Um, but it's just, it's just like a really fun cast group of people, um, witty, clever, doesn't outstay its welcome. And it's just got that cries all sort of magic where it always feels like perfectly pitched, perfectly shot, perfectly edited. It's really good. I guess I just Googled it in the first review that came up. Five stars. People can, people who can claim the show is making fun of conservatives just because the gay teacher character was not fond of a conservative mum reporting him, yeah. a media illiterate. <laughs> I'm sure that there is some uh, media coverage about that, but it is a funny um, funny plot thread. Um, the last recommendation I'll get there, because I feel like this actually dominates a sort of worrying amount of my brain, but which I don't think I've ever actually talked about on the show, is Taskmaster. Have I ever talked about Taskmaster? Absolutely have. On the show? Yeah. Well, I'm going to recommend it again. All right. Taskmaster UK, we all know we love it. You know, some of the best comedians you heard of or haven't heard of come up through Taskmaster and then go on to bigger and better things. Um, Taskmaster New Zealand, incredibly good. They've done five seasons now. All of them very good. My friend Josh Thompson was on one series. It was very good. Uh, recent discovery, Taskmaster Australia with Tom Gleeson, surprisingly good. And a lot of like the local scene, which I'm a bit oblivious to. I know far more overseas comics than Australian comics. Yeah. But really an enjoyable bunch of, um, of members across the three seasons they've had. Uh, Aaron Chen, who I fucking love, is currently airing on, on the Australian scene. Um, a lot of uh, craziness last season with... Um, Lloyd Langford and Anne Edmonds, a married couple on the panel together. It's just really good. So I don't know. I'm just putting out there that Taskmaster continues to take up a lot of my brain space. I listen to the podcast when I'm at the gym and it's a good show. It's just a good premise. Make comedians do difficult things and then watch how they improv. There you go. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not doing confetti. I'm not. I'm didn't, not going to do it. Didn't say anything. Yeah. I'm not. I'm not going to do. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. People. People right now are looking at the number of seconds remaining on the podcast player and watching how close we're getting to the end. I'm not going to do it. You're pointing to me, gesturing like you're going to pay me money if I do it. I'm not. Ten thousand dollars. Fuck. Okay. <laughs> okay. Fuck. <laughs> Ten thousand New Zealand dollars, which is like five dollars. Uh, that's still <laughs> a lot of money. <laughs> I don't know the exchange rate is, but I assume it's low. Uh, maybe I'll just put some tumbleweeds. Yeah, put it. Put in a maybe some wolves howling. Some wolves. Nice. Yeah. Some wolves and some tumbleweeds. <laughs> okay. You know, what, get let people guess where we are. <laughs> Okay, so we're building a They're going to be like the internet because okay. that's where those two things can exist. Sure. 